Marxism contra justice, a critique of egalitarian ideology. Revolution is a job that must be done without weakness. We are but the instruments of a necessity that carries us along, drags us forward, lifts us up, which will doubtless pass over our dead bodies. For we are not chasing after some dream of justice, as the young idiots who write in little magazines say. We are doing what must be done, what cannot be left undone. The old world dug its own grave and is now falling in. Let's give it a little shove. That was a quote from Victor Serge, um, Concord City, 1930. One of the most common misconceptions surrounding Marxism today is that it constitutes a doctrine of social justice. So widespread is this belief that one often finds it held by Marxists and anti-Marxists alike. Alan Mass, editor of the American Trotskyist organ Socialist Worker, considers Marxian socialism part of a rich history of opposition to inequality and injustice, being at its heart a struggle for justice and equality. Likewise, coming from a quite different tradition, the French Maoist octogenarian Alain Badiou upholds justice as the qualification of an egalitarian moment of politics in Act Two. Even Richard, Spen Richard Spencer's right-wing Radix Journal affirms something similar. Marxism is the intellectual source of the modern social justice movement, prevalent among youths and in universities. While the evaluation here is no doubt negative, especially when compared with the positive appraisals of Mass and Badiou, the reactionaries nevertheless come closer to understanding this ideology's material root. Communist ideas about justice are appealing on a superficial level because equality seems an obvious truth in a society that revolves around money. <clears throat> in either case, whether positive or negative, these value judgments rest upon a faulty interpretation of Marxism's theoretical and practical premises. Neither Karl Marx nor his immediate successors based their critique of capitalism on an ideal of justice. This stood in marked contrast to the strains of utopian socialism that came before, which couched their demands in terms of righting wrongs and redressing historical grievances. Despite explicit disavowals on the part of Marx, however, many readers believed there was at least an implicit sense in which he felt that capitalist society is unjust. Roughly three dozen articles were written on the theme between 1970 and 1990 by analytical Marxists like Norman Garris, G.A. Cohen, and Alan W. Wood. But this debate rehashed without knowing it an earlier debate that pitted Edward Bernstein against Rosa Luxemburg on the one hand and Ernest Belfort Bax against Paul Defargue on the other. Grasping the true stakes of these debates requires a certain familiarity with the issue's development over time, so a brief overview of the various historical conceptions of justice is in order. Once this has been achieved, Marx's own views on the matter may be further elucidated, which will then shed light on what came later. <clears throat> a survey of the concept. Linguistically, the word for justice is closely related to the word for law or right in many European tongues. For example, um, okay, well, there's a symbol that I can't read because I'm not Greek, is not far removed from another Greek word in Greek. Well, the German gerechtigkeit and Russian is a Russian word, contain rect and another Russian word I can't read, respectively. In French, the terms for justice and droit are a bit farther apart, although droitur is a near synonym for the first, just as with righteousness or rectitude in English. Writers like Jacques Derrida have gone to great lengths to dissociate justice from law or right, the latter two are deconstructible, whereas the former is not. <clears throat> Uncoupling these associations proves a tricky task, uh, 
though for while most will readily acknowledge a distinction, surely Allah may be deemed unjust. Few would separate them entirely. Motang remarked that we call justice the hodgepodge of laws that falls down into our hands, along with their application, very often iniquitous or inept. These laws tend to fluctuate both in time and in space, leading one commenter to surmise that justice is fickle, simply what has been established, quite like finery, analogized Pascal, justice is dictated by fashion. Etymology only goes so far, so other avenues must be sought. By tracing the role justice has played in thought and relating this back to the social and economic forces that undergirded them, a materialist explanation of this phenomenon is possible. Justice occupies a lo lofty space in the history of political philosophy. Plato declared it supreme among the virtues, <clears throat> the noblest trait that any person could possess. His dialogue Republic opens with a lengthy disquisition on the subject, in which young Polemarchus appeals to the authority of the poet Simonides in order to say, it is just to give to each what is owed to him. This dictum, the so-called sum, sum su, suik, <laughs> I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, usually rendered as to each his due, has endured as the standard definition of justice down through the ages. According to the ancient statesman, Cicero, its name in Greek is derived from giving each his own while in Latin it is derived from choosing, Greeks put the essence of justice in equity, while we Romans place it in choice, but both are attributes of the law. In his late treatise on moral ends, Cicero refers to justice as an attitude that assigns each person their due and thus preserves the cohesion of human society. Our nature is endowed with an innately civic and social character what the Greeks call, it's a Greek word in the Greek alphabet that I don't know. During the Enlightenment, Kant would praise this intuitive sense of equality as the officium commerci or sociab sociabilitis of humanity. Society cannot subsist unless some rules of justice are tolerably observed, asserted Smith. Yet, as the renowned bourgeois legal theorist Hans Kelsen maintained, swim, fuck, suum sweeki tribier, which again, <clears throat> I'm pronouncing very incorrectly, remains an empty formula. Left unanswered is the question of what is owed to everyone, at best, as, at best suggesting a bare notion of equality which of course turns out to be tautological. Equality or the principle that equals deserve equality, frequently taken to be the essence of justice, amounts to little more than the logical principle of identity, merely conveying the idea of order or unity within a system. Glancing at the inventory of past philosophical systems, one sees just how widely the meaning of equality could vary. What it meant to a particular philosopher depended in great measure on the historical conditions under which he lived. All men think justice to be a sort of equality, proclaimed Aristotle in his politics. For what is just is just for someone. It should be equal for equals. Still, it is unclear. Equality or inequality of what? Plato, as if responding to his erstwhile pupil, addressed this in his late dialogue on the laws. Indiscriminate equality for all, for all amounts to inequality, and fills a state with quarrels between its citizenry. <clears throat> the founder of a city-state must make justice his aim, granting much to the great and less to the less great, adjusting what is given to account for the real nature of each as this is the equality that unequals ultimately deserve to get. <clears throat> Obviously, this implies that the distribution of wealth would be determined by stature and not by need. 
distributive justice for Aristotle was the principle that awards ought to be proportional to merit. Justness in distribution must be measured according to merit somehow, he wrote in his Nicomachean Ethics. <laughs> but Democrats equate merit with the status of free men, supporters of oligarchy with property or noble birth, and supporters of aristocracy with excellence. Note that Dem Note that democracy for Athenians was not incompatible with the existence of slaves. Quite the contrary, it presupposed them. Regardless, this was to be distinguished from retributive justice, which administered punishments based on the ius talionis, or right of retaliation. Here an element of equality still obtains since penalties are supposed to be commensurate with the in with the injury sustained contributive justice had already been outlined in plato's proposal for a citywide division of labor in which everyone is assigned tasks for which they are suited as socrates says that justice is doing one's own work and not meddling with what is not one's own finally there is commuti commutative or rectificatory justice, the kind that covers transactions like the exchange of goods and services, which deals in exact equivalence. Plato felt that such justice was especially useful when it came to matters of money. Modern accounts increasingly centered on the last sort of justice, since it pertained most to money and ownership. Undoubtedly, this reflected shifts in the underlying structure of society over the course of centuries. As Montesquieu put it, the spirit of commerce, l'esprit de, com de commerce, produces in people a feeling for exact justice, justice exact. Gratius, the Dutch jurist, saw free trade as the surest way to guarantee a just peace, and upheld Horace's satiric maxim in earnest. Expediency, self-love, might perhaps be called the mother of justice and equity, but it was Thomas Hobbes and his Leviathan who gave the best summation of this new sensibility, which insisted that justice consists in the keeping of valid covenants. <clears throat> he said, this is the fountain origin of justice, for where no covenant has proceeded, no right can be transferred. Every man has a right to everything, and thus no action can be unjust. When a covenant is made, then to break it is unjust. The definition of injustice is nothing other than the not performance of covenant. Yet this can also be gathered out of the ordinary definition of justice in the schools. For they say that justice is the constant will of giving every man his own. Hence, where there is no own, that is, no property or propriety, there is no injustice. Locke, despite disagreeing with Hobbes on a whole range of related issues, nevertheless regarded this proposition to be as certain as any demonstration in Euclid. Property being a right to anything, and injustice being the invasion or violation of this right, I can just as certainly know the proposition, where there is no property there can be no injustice, to be true, as that a triangle has three angles equal to two right ones. Rochefoucauld uh, concurred with this judgment from across the channel, musing that justice is merely an intense fear that our belongings will be taken away from us. David Hume elaborated on this point in his Treatise of Human Nature, locating the source of justice in man's relationship to nature. Justice takes its rise from human, human conventions, and these are intended to remedy inconveniences which proceed from concurrence of certain qualities of the human mind with the situation of external objects. Qualities of the mind being selfishness and limited genero generosity, and situation of external objects being their easy change, along with their scarcity compared to the desires of men. If nature supplied abundantly all our wants, then the jealousy of interest assumed by justice could no longer have any place nor would there be any further need for those distinctions and limits of property and possession, 
presently in use among mankind. Such passages illustrate a specifically modern understanding of justice founded on ideas about property and right, which in turn corresponded to new material relations of production. At the same time, the logic of universal commodity exchange brought with it a notion of equivalence and interchangeability, lending, cre lending credence to the juridical principle of equality before, before the law. Gone were the feudal privileges and artificial hierarchy of old, replaced by bourgeois rights and natural equality. Though some segments of the population were still excluded from the franchise, the most consistent advocates of this concept of justice extended it to all irrespective of gender. Payne, Wollstonecraft, Condorcet, and race, Hume, Smith, Raynal. On this ba basis arose the Rechstadt, which governed by the rule of law instead of granting titles to different estates. While examples can no doubt be adduced from the tradition of German jurisprudence, from Pufendorf and Leibniz to Kant and Hegel, this would take up too much space. It is enough for now to recall Diderot's 1755 encyclo encyclopedia entry on natural right. Right is the wellspring and foundation of justice, the obligation to render unto each person what is due to him. But what is due to one person rather than another in a world where everything belongs to everyone? Hume's offhand remark that sufficient plenitude or abundance might do away with questions of justice once and for all must in any case be taken seriously, perhaps more seriously than he could have ever guessed. Nature can be made to yield more through artificial means. Either way, the proper, either way, the problem of property enters in at this point, with Marx trailing not far behind. Doing justice to Marx. Marx was always suspicious of moralizing rhetoric, particularly rhetoric invoking justice. After drafting the statutes for the International Workingmen's Association in autumn 1864, he complained in a letter to Engels. I was obliged to insert two sentences about duty and right, and ditto truth, morality, and justice, in the preamble to the rules, but these are so placed that they can do no harm. This distrust of high-sounding appeals to morality and justice was a constant feature of Marx's work throughout his career. From first to last, he condemned ide ideological catchphrases about justice as poor substitutes for materialist knowledge. Starting with his polemics against Proudhon and Heinzen in the 1840s, up through his severe rebukes of Ockberg and LaSalle in the 1870s, Marx consistently rejected the use of such saccharine language. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon's 1846 philosophy of poverty offered the opportunity to stage a showdown between utopian socialism and its scientific counterpart. Until then, Marx and Engels had devoted most of their energies to criticizing the various left-wing Hegelians and true socialists scattered in Germany. Now they decided to take on the leading socialist figure in France. Because Proudhon dabbled in both German philosophy and British political economy, he seemed the perfect candidate for critique. Justice or justice éternelle was Proudhon's principal category of judgment, which he used to decree the glaring inequalities of the present, so Marx singled it out for special abuse. Capital capitalist society, as the latter saw it, had made everything equal by subjecting it all to indiscriminate exchange. One man during an hour is worth just as much as another man during an hour, Marx explained. Time is everything, man is nothing, or else he is but time's carcass. Quality no longer matters as quantity alone decides everything, hour for hour, day for day. Yet this equalizing of labor is by no means the work of Proudhon's eternal justice. Rather, it is simply a fact of modern industry. In other words, far from conflicting with the norms of capitalist production, the eternal justice championed by Proudhon instead hypostasized them. Later in Capital, Marx repeated this point. 
Proudhon creates his ideal of justice, or just justice eternelle, from the juridical relations that correspond to the production of commodities. He thereby proves to the consolation of every good petit bourgeois that the production of commodities is a form as eternal as justice. Then he turns around and seeks to reform the actual production of commodities, as well as the corresponding legal system, in accordance with this ideal. What would one think of a chemist who, instead of studying the actual laws that govern molecular interactions, claimed to regulate such interactions by means of eternal ideas, such as naturalité and affinité, etc. Reversing Reversing cause and effect, Proudhon tried to transplant the ideological superstructure of society onto its material base. Evgeny Pashukhanis, the great Soviet legal scholar, commented on these lines in a 1923 text. In his critique of Proudhon, Marx pointed out that the abstract concept, concept of justice is by no means an absolute eternal criterion on which one can erect an ideal or just relation of exchange. Pashikanis perceived, for the concept of justice is itself inferred from the exchange relation and has no significance beyond this. Basically, the concept of justice does not contain anything substantively new apart from the bourgeois conceit of the equal worth of all men. Marx's insight into this matter not only has implications for justice, moreover, but could also, ap could also apply just as forcefully to notions of right as he spelled out in his subsequent critique of the Gotha program. Right by its nature exists only as the application of an equal standard, but unequal individuals are measurable by an equal standard only if they are subjected to an equal, equal criterion. Here the same principle prevails as regulates the exchange of commodities on the market, insofar, it is, insofar as it is an exchange of equal values. Gerechtigkeit, as Wood astutely observes, is for Marx a Rechtsbegriff. So anything that can be said about Recht can be said of it as well. At any rate, it would be folly to expect that lectures about the injustice of class society would lead the property classes to experience pangs of conscience. So long as one is bourgeois, Marx stressed, one cannot but see in this antagonistic relation a relation of pure harmony and eternal justice, which allows no one to gain at the expense of another. The purchase and sale of labor power appears as an exchange of equivalents to buyer and seller alike, an assertion fleshed out in more detail in Capital. On the one hand, the daily sustenance of labor power costs only half a day's labor, while on the other hand, the very same labor power can remain effective can work during a whole day, and consequently the value its use creates during one day is double what the capitalist pays for that use. This circumstance is a piece of good luck for the buyer, but by no means an injustice toward the seller. What this means is that workers and capitalists share the same conception of justice, and not only in the sense that the ideology of the ruling class is dominant. Indeed, the social norms of capitalism appear natural to everyone living under it, enveloped as they are by the fetishism of commodities. Marx laid bare this inverted reality, writing that the notions of justice held by both the worker and the capitalist have as their basis a form of appearance, which makes the actual relation invisible and presents to the eye the precise opposite of that relation. Even if the actual relation were made visible, the real inequality oh, fuck, the real inequality underlying apparent equality thus unmasked, it does not follow that workers are defrauded in the transaction. Although Marx sometimes described the initial confrontation between labor and capital as involving an unequal exchange, which allows for the production of surplus value. He always came back to the point that capitalism is a form of domination founded on abstract equivalence.
Um, nothing could have been further from Marx's mind than to pursue egalitarian remedies of the type prescribed by John Francis Bray. This egalitarian ideal, which some would like to apply as a corrective to the world, is itself nothing but the reflection of the world. It is impossible to reconstitute society on the basis of what is simply an embellished shadow of it. Unequal exchange, whether between worker and capitalist at the local labor market or between core and periphery in global trade, is hardly a Marxian figure of thought anyway. Polemicizing against William James Gilbert's claim that it is a self-evident principle of natural justice, that borrowers ought to repay lenders for the profits gained through successful investments. Marx wrote in the third volume of Capital that the justice of transactions between different agents of production consists in the fact these transactions arise from ex existing productive relations as their natural consequence. But the legal forms in which these economic transactions appear whether as voluntary actions of the participants, expressions of their common will, or contracts enforceable by the state, cannot themselves determine this content, since they simply express it. The content is just so long as it corresponds to the mode of production and is adequate to it, unjust as soon as it contradicts it. Slavery is unjust on the basis of capitalism, as is cheating on the quality of goods. Justice's connection to equality having now been dealt with, its relation to fairness can be examined briefly. While this is complicated somewhat by the fact that the word is often translated into German as Gerechtigkeit, a few things may still be said. Fairness is notably absent from Marx's vocabulary, even in his English writings. He did take issue with a popular Chartist slogan, though, in a major 1865 speech delivered in London. Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, workers ought to inscribe on their banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the entire wage system. Left Ricardians tend to focus on the portion of unpaid labor in the valorization process, which is the source of surplus value protesting low wages rather than wages as such, and surplus value rather than value as such. Distributive justice may be the final word for many socialists, but to Marx, the Lasallian demand for fair distribution just confused the issue. Vulgar socialists have taken over from bourgeois economists the treatment of distribution as independent of the mode of production, and hence the presentation of socialism as turning principally on distribution. Besides its connotations of fairness, lawfulness, equality, and, and impartiality, justice also carries a strong mor moral resonance. Karl Heinzen, a Prussian phaetonist, sought to elevate socialist discourse in a series of 1847 articles appealing to justice, morality, and other verité éternelle. Responding to Heinzen with bitter invective, Engels penned a, sp a piece on both his and Marx's behalf. Marx had personally vowed to destroy Heinzen on a previous occasion, so it fell to Engels to fire the opening salvo. Communists have made fun of Heinzen's stern moral demeanor, Engels openly admitted, mocking all those sacred and sublime ideas of virtue, justice, etc., which he imagines form the basis of every society. We maintain, moreover, that these eternal ver verities are by no means the basis, but on the contrary, the product of the society in which they feature. Eventually, Marx joined in the fray as well, after Heinzen had taken Engels' bait with his classic rejoinder on moralizing criticism and critical morality appearing the next month. In it, Marx heaped scorn upon Heinzen's simplistic questions of conscience and cliches about justice, and castigated every attempt to place socialism on a, on a moral foundation. Similar phrases would later recur in the manifesto, written around the same time for a party which had until recently been known as the just. 
Thirty years on, however, these mistakes were repeated by another Carl H., this time Hochberg, editor of the socialist paper Zukunft. As soon as Marx got word of Zukunft's editorial line, he set about denouncing the renewed ascendancy of the goddesses of justice, liberty, equality, etc. as a modern mythology. Not long afterward, he wrote to his friend, the German-American communist Frederick Adolf Sorg, to inform him, In Germany, a corrupt spirit is asserting itself in our party, not so much among the masses as among the leaders, the upper class, and workers. Our compromise with the Lasallians has led to further compromise with other waverers like During and his admirers, not to mention the swarm of immature undergraduates and overwise graduates who want to give socialism a higher idealistic orientation instead of the materialist basis, a modern mythology with its goddesses, justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Franz Mehring, who knew Marx and Engels firsthand, reported in his biography of the former that, for them, phrases like justice, humanitarianism, liberty, equality, fraternity, and independence nothing more than moral platitudes. What they termed modern mythology was abhorrent to them. During the hectic days of the 1848 revolution, they recognized only a single test, for or against. Neo-Kantian revisionism, Luxembourg versus Bernstein. Everything in the previous section is well known, of course. Scholarly papers unpacking Marx's attitude toward justice are fairly common, though perhaps few have been laid out, laid out in such a condensed fashion. More interesting is the debate on the issue that transpired between prominent Marxists in the decades following his death, which has received far less attention. This is somewhat surprising given the extent to which it prefigured arguments about Marxism and justice, morality and ethics, that have taken place since. An aphorism from, from Adorno is apt here, to the effect that the political theorist who intervenes in practical controversies nowadays discovers on a regular basis, and to his shame, that whatever ideas he might contribute were expressed long ago, and usually better the first time around. Rosa Luxemburg's dispute with Edward Bernstein is doubtless an instance of this, not to mention Paul Lefergue's quarrel with Ernest Belfort Bax. Nearly a century before Alex Kalinikos lamented Marxism's ethical deficit, the German socialist Bernstein wondered if ideals such as morality, justice, and rights could be rehabilitated for the workers' movement. Under the influence of the neo-Kantian legal philosopher Rudolf Stamler, whose lengthy 1896 work, Wirtschaft und Recht, engaged critically, but respectfully, with a materialist conception of history. Bernstein felt that Marxists underestimated the importance of ideological factors in questions relating to politics. Because his argument is relatively straightforward and his conclusions so confident and far-reaching, it is best to simply quote Bernstein's 1898 article on the realistic and the ideological moments in socialism at length and keep the exegesis to a minimum. Here, if not elsewhere, the text speaks for itself. This is a massive quotation. One ideological factor to be considered in connection with socialism is moral consciousness or the concept of justice. While nobody denies in principle the importance of interest as a motive and knowledge as a guide, there are sharply conflicting claims as to the importance of moral consciousness in modern socialist literature. For example, the Manifesto and other writings by Marx and Engels from that period seem to take a markedly negative view of the subject. But in their later works as well, Marx and Engels avoid any direct appeal to ethical sensibilities. Professor Werner Sombart has identified this anti-ethical tendency as the distinctive characteristic of Marxist socialism, an unfortunate expression since the term anti-ethical 
conveys first and foremost that ethics as such will be done away with, but perfectly accurate in the sense Sombart uses it. Namely, to denote the reverse of deriving socialism from ethical principles, as nothing in the Marxist theory derives from ethics. Quite the contrary, ethics are mentioned time and again, but only for the explicit purpose of pointing out their inadequacy. In capital, the buying and selling of labor power as a commodity in which a worker brings his own hide to market is described as an act governed by freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. While the circumstance that labor power can produce more than the cost of its maintenance is said to be a piece of good luck for the buyer, but by no means an injustice towards the seller. In his critique of the Gotha program, Marx criticizes the demand for a fair distribution of the proceeds of labor. The present distribution of the proceeds of labor is the only fair distribution on the basis of the modern mode of production. In his preface to the first German edition of Poverty of Philosophy, Engels states that to derive communist demands from the fact a worker's wage does not correspond to the value of the work he does is formally incorrect in economic terms because it is simply an application of morality to economics. Still more pointed criticisms can be found in anti during and on the housing question. Aside from a few choice quotations from Engels, most of this was already covered in the last section. Having set up Marx and Engels' theoretic, theoretical self-understanding, however, Bernstein proceeded to argue this self-understanding was directly contravened by their practical activity. They said one thing, but did another. Put a bit differently, the official disdain for moral categories bellied a hidden reliance on them. In any case, Bernstein felt Marxism spoke too much to workers' heads instead of listening to what was in their hearts. This is another massive quotation. Marxist practice appears to be in complete contradiction with the hostile stance adopted toward ethics by the theory. Capital is riddled with pronouncements based on moral judgments. The very description of wage relation as one of exploitation assumes a moral judgment, since the concept of exploitation applied to human relations always implies unauthorized appropriation and overreach. And in accepted popularizations, surplus value is often branded as fraud, theft, and robbery. The capitalist employer, even when he is a fair employer, is presented as the appropriator of surplus value, which does not belong to him. While the worker, even when he belongs to the best paid section of his class, is presented it has it at oh, fuck, is presented as having been denied some part of his due. Of course, there are occasional writers to the effect that the capitalist is not personally to blame for this appropriation, but is merely doing what he is entitled to do, under conditions which he did not create. But this very apology implies that the appropriation of surplus value is fundamentally an injustice. Furthermore, the theory of surplus value's objectivity withstands scrutiny only in the context of abstract inquiry. As soon as its application is at issue, it reveals itself as a moral problem, and people usually treat it as such. Engels commented, if the moral consciousness of the masses declares a given economic fact unjust, as it is done in the case of slavery or serfdom, that is proof the fact had been outlived. Now other economic facts have made their appearance, owing to which the former facts have become unbearable and untenable. This statement gives the moral judgment of the masses a scintilla of validity, but only the function of a yardstick. Looking at the matter more closely and asking ourselves why so many people nowadays regard the economic fact of the capitalist's appropriation, a surplus value, as an in, as in, as an injustice, we come upon a further concession to idealism or ideology. For the fact of surplus value is not immediately apparent to the masses. Indeed, the mechanisms of the capitalist economy conceal it from them. Socialist writers in the age of manufacture and before were able to posit theories that led to the theory of surplus value 
only due to the simplicity and transparency of the economic mechanisms mechanisms of their age. Under modern conditions, it was mainly bourgeois economists whose investigations into the value of commodities led them to the value of labor as a commodity, which paved the way for the recognition that the worker's wage is different from, and always less than, the value of the work he does. And yet the fact of surplus labor has always been familiar to the worker. Though he did not always object to it in principle, he did so often enough in a practical and limited fashion. He rebelled not against the fact of surplus labor, but only against the extent of it. Once the worker learns that he never receives and pay the full value of the work he does, however, his natural sense of justice is directly challenged because the concept of value includes a moral element, a concept of equality and justice. Moral concepts are more durable than economic developments precisely because they are more conservative. They are to an extent unaffected by such developments. Certainly this is true of the concept of justice more than Marx and Engels wanted to admit. Bernstein was un fuck. Bernstein was convinced, like many Marxists of his generation, Schmidt, Vorlander, even the Orthodox Kotsky, that Marx and Engels could be reconciled with Kant. The modern proletarian movement fights its emancipatory struggle under the banner of Kant, not Hegel. Averred Bernstein in 1905. He had closed his revisionist manifesto six years earlier with a chapter cleverly entitled Kant Against Kant, in which he restated his aversion to Hegelian philosophy before repeating the neo-Kantian rallying cry, back to Kant. Reconciling Marxism with Kant would require not only a theory of the world as it is, but also of the world as it ought to be. For Bernstein, what ought to exist was a more equi equitable social order. Only by instilling a sense of ethical obligation in the working class would this be brought about. Justice is a powerful motivating force within the socialist movement today wrote Bernstein. No action on the part of the masses can have lasting effect without a moral impetus. Luxembourg disagreed. Unlike Bernstein and his fellow revisionists, she held firm to Marxism's dialectical mode of thought. Dialectical thinking permits no flat contraposition of is and ought, nor does it allow for the strict separation of theory and practice. Still further, it grounds abstract ideas about how things ought to be in the concrete reality of the way they are. What Bernstein considers to be general human morality is merely the dominant morality. Luxembourg declared, that is, bourgeois morality. In her 1899 pamphlet, Social Reform or Revolution, she subjected Bernstein's notions about justice to a withering critique. Bernstein refers to socialism as an effort toward a just, juster, and still more just distribution. It cannot be denied that the proximal cause leading the masses into the socialist movement is precisely the unjust distribution characteristic of capitalism. When Marxism struggles for the socialization of the entire economy, it aspires therewith also to a just distribution of social wealth guided by Marx's insight that the distribution of a given epoch is a natural consequence of the mode of that epoch's production, though it does not struggle against this distribution within the framework of capitalist production. Marxism struggles rather for the suppression of capitalist production itself. It seeks to establish socialist distribution by suppressing the capitalist mode of production. Conversely, Bernstein proposes to fight capitalist distribution in order to establish the socialist mode of production. So what is the basis of Bernstein's program for the reform of society? Does it find support in, in definite tendencies of capitalist production? No. First of all, he denies such tendencies. In the second place, the socialist transformation of production is for him the effect and not the cause of distribution. He cannot give his program a materialist base, as he has already overthrown the means and ends of the movement for socialism, 
and so is obliged to construct an idealist base. Bernstein's super, superlatively just distribution is to be attained thanks to man's free will. Man's will acting not because of economic necessity, since this will itself is only an instrument, but because of man's comprehension of justice, because of man's idea of justice. Conjuring the ghost of the self-taught tailor and early communist Wilhelm Wheatling, Luxembourg turned the phrase. We are thus brought back to the happy principle of justice, that old war horse on which reformers have rocked for ages, for lack of better means of transportation, to that lamentable rockinant on which the dawn quixots of history have galloped toward the improvement of the world, only to return with both eyes blackened. Rich versus poor as the basis of socialism, the principle of cooperation as its content, just distribution as its aim, and the idea of justice as its only historic legitimation. With how much more force, fire, and wit did Waitling defend that sort of socialism 50 years ago? However, that genius of a tailor did not know a scientific socialism. If today the conception torn to bits by Marx and Engels, um, i.e. Wheatlings, more than a half, more than a half century ago, is patched up and presented to the proletariat as the last word in social science, then that too is the art of a tailor. But it has nothing genius about it. Several years later, on the topic of the woman question, Luxembourg gave an abbreviated version of the same idea. Marxism does not use the argument of injustice, she wrote. This is the basic difference between us and earlier sentimental forms of utopian socialism. For we do not rely on the justice of the ruling classes, but solely on the revolutionary power of the working masses and on the course of social development which prepares the ground for this power. Injustice by itself is certainly not an argument with which to overthrow reactionary institutions. But if there is a feeling of injustice in large segments of society, as Frederick Engels, co-founder of Scientific Socialism, once said, this is always a sure sign that the economic bases of the society have shifted considerably, that the present conditions contradict the marsh of development. Luxembourg's orthodox defense of the Marxian critique of justice in reply to Bernstein is an exemplary model of the sort of of the sort of back and forth that went on over the issue between 1889 and 1914. Lefergue's exchange with Belfort Bax from 1905 is another. Proprietary metaphysics, Lefergue versus Belfort Bax. Ernest Belfort Bax was among the earliest British exponents of Marxism dedicating an article to Marx's doctrine in 1881. Upon reading it, Marx, Marx himself hailed it as the first English publication to be, per, to be pervaded by a real enthusiasm for the new ideas, and which boldly stands up to Anglo-Saxon Philistinism. Prior to his discovery of Marxist literature in 1879, Bax had studied music and philosophy in Stuttgart, before being appointed Berlin correspondent for the standard. He met the neo-Kantian metaphysician Edward von Hartmann in 1880, with whom he had lengthy discussions about Kant, Hegel, and Schopenhauer. While this, while this familiarity with German idealist discourse made Bax more receptive to materialist dialectic, he and his cohorts in the weekly newspaper Justice remained ignorant of the philosophical content of Marxism, perhaps owing to the unavailability of manuscripts Marx had written in the 1840s. Regardless, this was to their great theoretical and practical detriment, as Engels noted in a letter to Laura Lefergue, dated February 16, 1884. Bax believed that modern socialism needed a solid ethical core, which Marx neglected to provide, and so he put out a collection of essays on the ethics of socialism in 1889 to compensate for this lack. This collection included a sketch contrasting bourgeois and proletarian conceptions of justice. 
For Bax, however, these narrow class conceptions corresponded to broader individualist and socialist outlooks, which in turn reflected an age-old conflict between the individual and society. Modern individualism crystallizes its idea of justice and the individual's absolute right to possess and exercise control over such property as he has legally acquired. Modern socialism crystallizes its idea of justice and the community's absolute right to possess and exercise control over all wealth, not intended for direct individual use. Justice itself, for at least some notion of it, was a relative constant in Bax's view. Socialism could not do away with the idea of justice altogether, but simply supplant individualism's idea of justice with its own. Inviolability of property would be replaced by confiscation of property, but only with the arrival of a revolutionary crisis overturning bourgeois rule. Once that crisis comes, predicted Bax, the great act of confiscation will be the seal of the new era. Not till then will the, will the death knell of class society with its rights of property be sounded when justice, not capitalist, but rather socialist justice, will become the cornerstone of society. Later in his Problems of Men, Mind, and Morals, Bax reaffirmed his postulate that there are certain lines of conduct which are essential in all societies, no matter how rudimentary, whereas others vary from age to age and from one form of social organization to another. While the first represent the root principles of ethics, the second are phenomenal applications of these principles, as determined by the conditions of the society in question. According to Aristotle and the Greeks, ethical concep conceptions can always be traced back to the idea of justice or equity. Ethical norms are widely variable, in other terms, depending on what is considered just at any given point in time. Ultimately, Bax speculated that justice derives in turn from feelings of sympathy, a belief which places him closer to British empiricist traditions than he might have wanted to admit. Despite his lifelong antipathy toward the Benthamites, whom he denounced as utilitarian individualists early in his career, Bax eventually adopted a species of utilitarianism in articulating a socialist theory of justice. He wrote of a new humanist ethic, an ethic of human solidarity, taking shape alongside socialism in politics. The new ethic is emphatically utilitarian, but its utilitarianism is definite in conscience and conscious. Bax took this even further though, identifying in Marx's practice an ethical streak. Paul Lefergue's path to Marxism was more intimate than that of Bax. Initially, Lefergue had been a prudonist, appealing often to ideals like justice and humanity. Marx, whose London residence he began to frequent in 1865, was deeply annoyed a feeling he made known to his daughter, Laura. That damned boy, Lefargue, pesters me with his prudonism. He will not rest until I have administered to him a sound cudgeling of his creole pate. Or pate. Pate? Pate? Pate. Pate. Just pate. Yeah, pate makes sense. Just three years later, the young Cuban immigrant married her. Once he had received his medical license in Paris to practice as a surgeon. Lefergue's mature views on justice took shape over the course of the 1870s, especially while translating an excerpt from Engels' Anti During as the shortened pamphlet Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. As his biographer Leslie Durfler makes clear, Lefergue came to regard socialism not as the realization of ideals like justice and equality, but as the necessary and, ine and inevitable outgrowth of capitalism. Starting in the 1880s, he penned a series of investigations into the origin of abstract ideas meant to demonstrate to skeptics that the materialist approach to history could count or could account for complex systems of thought. One of the abstractions he hoped to explain was justice. <clears throat> Multiple versions of the article appeared spanning roughly two decades. The idea of the just does not descend from men to things, Lefargue asserted in a French version published in 1885. 
Rather, it ascends from things to men. In an 1899 follow-up for Dinuzite, he expanded on this assertion. Justice in civilized societies flows from two sources, he wrote. First of all, from the pre-existing nature of human beings, and second, from the social milieu organized around private property. Passions which dwelled in man since before the institution of property, together with the interests and ideas aroused by it, have given rise to concepts like just and unjust. Lefargue distinguished two overarching types, retributive justice and distributive justice. Vengeance or raksakt was the was the anthropological basis for the first. Equality or glycheit was the sociological basis for the second. Although revenge also involved a crude form of equality, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, this gave way to a more refined form of equality based on exchange. So preponderant was the role of property in the elaboration of justice that it obscured the initial workings of retaliation to the point where a people as subtle as the Greeks and minds as sharp as those of Hobbes or Locke could not perceive it. For Lefargue, the real novelty of Marx's historical method was his discovery of the economic and material foundations upon which the ideological edifice of society was erected. Ideas such as progress, justice, liberty, fatherland, etc. do not exist outside of themselves and outside the spiritual domain, like the axioms of mathematics, he wrote. They do not precede experience, but instead follow it, do not engender the events of history, but are the consequence of so social phenomena which create, transform, or suppress them. One of the tasks of history unnoticed by philosophers is the discernment of social causes, of which they themselves are a result. Whereas idealist philosophy attributed causal efficacy to these ideas, materialist criticism grasped them as mere epiphenomena, byproducts of the forces and relations of production, the real locomotives of history. Nowhere was this clearer than with ideas about justice and right. Ruling classes always consider what serves their economic and political agenda to be just, while anything that deserves this same agenda is unjust. The justice it idealizes is realized as soon as its class interests are satisfied. Hence, the interests of the bourgeoisie are the guides of bourgeois justice, just as the interests of the aristocracy were the guides of feudal justice. Almost as if by unconscious irony, justice is pictured blindfolded so she cannot see the mean and sordid interests protected under her aegis. Justice, who philosophers tell us reigns in bourgeois society, guaranteeing peace and happiness, is on the contrary the fertile mother of social in iniquities. It was justice who gave slaveholders the right to possess men like chattel, and it is she who now gives capitalists the right to exploit men, women, and children like beasts of burden. She permitted slaveholders to live off the toil of slaves and today permits capitalists to seize the surplus created by wage laborers. I stand on my right, said the slaveholders. I stand on my right, say the capitalists. Does it follow that bourgeois right will be displaced by proletarian right, or the justice of capitalists by the justice of workers? Lefargue answered this emphatically in the negative. Communist revolution, by abolishing private property and holding everything in common, will liberate man. Then the concepts of justice which have weighed on men's brains since the establishment of private property will finally vanish. The most ghastly ghosts to ever haunt civilized humanity. Following Marx, Lefargue stated that concepts such as justice, right, and the state continue to have purchase only as long as social classes continue to endure. Put another way, the fact, the fact such ideals are still necessary is symptomatic of the ongoing division within society itself, a testament to humanity's persistent unfreedom. At this point, Bax felt compelled to intervene on the issue in the pages of Die Neue Zeit, where he accused his French colleague of tacitly relying on another ideal of justice, while pretending to condemn justice as such. In his article, Observed Bax, Lefargue seemingly commits a fallacy 
often encountered in philosophical discussions, presupposing precisely the concept against which he allegedly polemicizes. Reading his criticisms of freedom, justice, etc., one can hardly fail to notice that the critic himself has a certain ideal of freedom, justice, etc., that he presupposes as a norm or standard, which he uses to denigrate bourgeois forgeries. Beck saw this presupposition as more or less natural, though, or at least unavoidable. Some idea of justice is bound to persist, being eternal in the sense that it runs like a thread throughout human history. Wherever society exists, so must it also be present. Justice cannot be abolished, in other words, only perfected. Never gotten rid of entirely, only approximated more closely, this was consistent with Bax's own prior theor theorization of the concept seen above. Lefercu's response was unequivocal, appending a long footnote to the French revision of the text in 1909. Belfort Bax uh, reproaches me for the, con for the contempt in which I hold justice, liberty, and other ent entities of, pri fuck, of proprietary metaphysics, which he says are concepts so universal and so necessary that, in order to criticize their bourgeois caricatures, I avail myself as of a certain ideal of justice and liberty. He did not deny being a product of his age, but turned this back on Bax, arguing it further proved his point. Of course, we are obliged to submit to current ideas, Lefargue freely acknowledged. I am not able to escape my social environment any more than would a spiritualist philosopher. Even if ideas are necessary consequences of the social environment in which they are produced, though this does not mean they are necessary in all social environments, as Socrates held. Philosophers hold liberty and justice to be universal and necessary concepts because they know of no societies other than those founded on private property. Given a different set of circumstances, another configuration of values could come into being. Revisiting the, moder the modern debate. The foregoing should be enough to convince anyone of the richness of these early debates over justice within Marxism. A few words might still be said about the debates that took place between 1970 and 1990, though before hastening to a conclusion. In many respects, this later controversy covered much of the same ground, featuring similar references and even similar points of emphasis. What set it apart from its predecessor, besides its peculiar pitch, was perhaps the conceptual terrain on which the battle was fought. Most of the original combatants hailed from the Anglophone school of analytic Marxism, with others from outside that tradition joining later on. Robert C. Tucker and Alan W. Wood led the charge against moralistic interpretations, with the former insisting that the image of Marx as a prophet of social justice is a false one, and the latter that Marx denied capitalism was unjust. Because their arguments largely align with the one here, they can be set aside for now to examine counter-arguments voiced by their foremost critics. G. A. Cohen's objections to the Tucker Wood thesis, i.e. the Marx rejected moralizing critiques of capitalism, were at least twofold. On the one hand, like Bernstein before him, he found it difficult to think of any reason for using a term like exploitation, other than that it denotes a kind of injustice. Furthermore, in this connection, Cohen rejected the validity of the labor theory of value, a centerpiece of the Marxian analysis. Nevertheless, in his view, this had no bearing on the validity of the moral claim behind Marx's practice, since the relationship between the labor theory of value and the concept of exploitation is one of mutual relevance. Here again, Cohen resembles Bernstein, among the earliest of Marx's disciples to turn away from Arbeitswert theory. The labor theory of value is misleading above all in that it appears as a yardstick for the exploitation of the worker by the capitalist, Bernstein wrote in 1898. Value theory no more provides the criterion for the justice or injustice of a given distribution of wealth than does atomic theory for the beauty or ugliness of a sculpture. <laughs> 
It fails to communi- it fails to communicate exploitation's unjust character. Cohen likewise felt that value theory leaves out an essential normative premise from its description. Second, and in a slightly different key, he asserted that Marx had in fact implicitly provided a theory of justice with his motto, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. According to Cohen, this simultaneously implies a model of contributive from each and distributive to each justice will still prevail under the higher stage of communism mentioned by Marx. Egalitarian justice in his sense of the term would thus serve as the guiding principle for revolutionaries along the way. Marxism, at least in Cohen's version, does not consider the concept of justice and anathema to its doctrine, but quite the contrary, stipulates it as an article of faith. Justice occupies a central place in revolutionary Marxist belief, Cohen contended in 1988. Revolutionary Marxism often misdescribes itself owing to a lack of awareness concerning its own nature. Disparagement of the idea of justice is a prime example of this deficient self-understanding. Norman Garris enters into the debate rather late, summarizing all the main arguments, assessing their strengths and weaknesses, and then presuming to have the final word. Between those who sought to dispense with the ideal of justice and those who sought to retain it, Garris strongly favored the second. The crux of the matter was in his view quite simple. Marx did think capitalism was unjust, but did not think that he thought so. Or as he repeated in an addendum several years later, Marx did condemn capitalism as unjust in the light of transhistorical norms albeit inconsistently, and with his own emphatic disavowals. Such claims are all the more provocative given that Marx, in those few places he actually discussed justice, insisted again and again that such concepts were imminently determined by historical factors related to the mode of production. What then could lead Garris to draw this inference? From what Marx says about capitalist robbery, we can, infer, we can infer a commitment to independent and transcendent standards of justice, he explained. Garris professed against Wood and various others that Marxian exploitation is a form of unequal exchange, the result of a transaction in which the rule equals for equals has been violated. In other words, the principle of commuti commutative justice was circumvented by the labor contract. Far from a merely metaphorical ornament, then, the robbery that occurs between capitalist and workers is quite literal. Marx's talk of robbery is not an add-on characterization to his pervasive portrayal of exploitation as a form of unequal exchange. The description of exploitation as an unequal exchange already says it is a kind of theft. But does Garris not succumb in this passage to the very bourgeois moralism Marx found so objectionable about, about left Ricardianism alluded to above? Patrick Murray's comment that the left Ricardian conception of justice is the standard commercial one, equal value for equal value, is apt here. Unable to extricate himself from this impasse, Garris imputed his own error to Marx, calling it Marx's own bourgeois principle. Etienne Balabar is about as far removed from Garris and Cohen as one can get, while still remaining a Marxist, yet his stance on the question of Marx and justice is very similar. It is no mystery that Marx himself was not very fond of the vocabulary of social justice and injustice. Balabar acknowledges, one of the reasons for his reluctant attitude may have to do with the extent to which, in his own time, the category of justice was associated to one of his intimate adversaries, namely Proudhon, an absolute egalitarian who claimed that justice, equality, mutuality, and association are reciprocal, interchangeable notions. Balabar nevertheless contends that some positive idea of justice is contained in the 11th thesis on Farabak since to change the world, one must first have an idea of how it should be. Marx tried to avoid the term justice itself, but certainly he could not completely avoid the idea 
Communism is an idea, and even an, an idea of order. There's also, according to Balabar, some originary experience of injustice described in Capital. Various authors from the world outside of analytical Marxism gradually entered the dispute. Daniel Bensed, Ernesto Scrupanti, and Sean Sayers all reflected on what had until then been a largely parochial affair. While Sayers allows that some of Marx's impassioned metaphors lend themselves to a moralistic interpretation, he has no patience for the accusation, leveled principally by Garris and Cohen, that this was merely due to insufficient insight. As an account of Marx's ideas, this contention is quite absurd, writes Sayers. Not only does Marx quite explicitly reject such views, but more importantly, the central thrust of Marx's whole method, the historical materialist approach, is in the clearest contradiction with them. Garrison Cohen are, of course, aware of this, but brush it aside with an arrogant disregard for hard evidence. Scripanti analogously argues that despite the frequent tone of moral indignation found in their writings, Marx's and Engels' concept of communism cannot be interpreted as a doctrine of the good society derived from an egalitarian philosophy of justice. Like Luxembourg, he associates such doctrines with pre-Marxist utopianism. The most substantial critique of the Garris Cohen interpretation came from Ben Said, however. He spent almost a whole chapter in his book, Marx for Our Times, responding to the claims of Garris and Cohen, as well as those of John Elster and John Romer. Ben Said parsed the arguments of the first two as follows. Garris seeks to reconcile the irreconcilable, insofar as the very notion of justice is alien to the sphere of production. <coughs> production. Discussing the unjust character of exploitation, in effect, makes no sense. Nothing obliges us to treat justice and theft as logically connected categories. The capitalist can perfectly well rob the worker without thereby deviating from his own idea of justice. So Garris's synthesis ultimately rests on the right to inconsistency. If Marx did not think what he believed he thought, the strategy pays off. Pushed into a corner, Garris aims to demonstrate that Marx's theory condemned capitalist society on the basis of criteria which are by no means relative. Although it appears to develop a relativist conception of justice, it is shot through with another conception of justice, irreducible to juridical institutions. While the formal antinomy between a relativist and a transhistoric conception of justice can only result in an aporia, there is in reality movement and mediation, a progressive development of justice. Capitalism and its specific representation of justice are open to condemnation only in the name of a superior system, just as with slavery or serfdom in their day. The whole problem then consists in determining how this superiority is defined. Here, Garris's theory of justice connects with the theory of history according to Cohen, which implies a normative measure. For Ben said, Marx offers no general ahistorical definition of justice. Justice is imminent in social relations. Each mode of production has its own conception, so it makes no sense to, pr to pronounce exploitation unjust without further explanation. Seen from the standpoint of capital, exploitation compensates for the risk, initiative, and responsibility of entrepreneurs. It seeks fair so long as it, or it's sorry, it seems fair so long as it partakes of the famous correspondence between the juridical sphere and mode of production. When challenged, it is not in the name of justice set against injustice or right against non-right. Rather, two representations of right clash in the name of formally antagonistic juridical arguments. An antinomy, right against right. Between two equal rights, force is the arbiter. And while right is not reducible to force, it is never wholly foreign to it, even in establishing its own initial legitimacy. On another occasion, Ben said apparently equipped that attempts to temper the critique of Marx with a theory of justice amount to a mixture of chalk and cheese. This is likely how Marx himself would have seen the matter, especially after one tallies the names considered in this essay and sees how they lined up politically vis-a-vis -vis the debate over justice. 
Pro-Justice, the Petite Bourgeois Anarchist Proudhon, the Neo-Kantian Revisionist Bernstein, the Woman-Phobic Sued Bax, the Left Laborite Cohen, and the Eustonite Garris. Contra-Justice, the Proletarian Revolutionary Marx, the Spartacist Luxembourg, the Gifted and Profound Lefergue, the Libertarian Communist Scripanti, and the Trotskyist Benzed. Such balance sheets perhaps seem peremptory, but could not be more fitting when it comes to a figure like justice, traditionally represented with a set of scales, weighing one side objectively against the other in order to render judgment. At any rate, some final reflections might now be offered by way of conclusion on the subjects of justice, Lenin, and the law. Conclusion. Another word in the Greek alphabet that nobody can read except for people that know ancient Greek. The Greek goddess of justice was, according to the Orphic theogony, the daughter of law and piety. She was portrayed holding balancing scales, the same device used by merchants to calculate the worth of precious metals. Her Roman counterpart, Lestitia, carried a sword to illustrate the role of force in executing her judgment. During the Renaissance, a blindfold was added to denote her impartiality, as seen in Hans Georg's 1546 sculpture for the Gerechtigkeitsbrunnen in Berg. That is a long-ass word. Rousseau wrote two centuries later in nearby Geneva that the axiom of justice, <laughs> sweek sum, serves as the basis of the whole right of property. Aside of every courthouse today can be found some similar representation. Justice is therefore indissolubly bound up with the concepts of law, right, commerce, and property, confirming Pashikanis' aforementioned suspicion that its logic is inferred from the principle of equality and exchange. Freedom and equality are not only respected in value exchange, but value exchange is in fact the real productive basis of all freedom and equality. Marx maintained in the Grand Ries, as pure ideas, they are merely idealized expressions of this basis. If developed into juridical and political systems, they are merely this basis taken to a higher power. This is the sense in which the reactionary author cited at the outset was correct, that the ideal of equality receives its currency from monetary relations, or the circulation of commodities, although he wrongly equated Marxism with this ideal. Engels refuted this erroneous formula at length in anti-During. Marxism aims to transcend equality before the law and thereby justice as such. Bourgeois theoreticians of justice have at, this, have at times discerned this more clearly than self-styled Marxian socialists even if their reasons for pointing it out are deprecatory or depreciatory, deprecatory. Kelsen, for example, communism is the typical utopia of a golden age, a paradise where not only is Mark pro Marx prophesied the narrow horizon of bourgeois law, but since there will be no conflicts of interest, also the much wider horizon of justice will be completely overcome. John Rawls likewise commented in his lectures on the history of political philosophy that, for Marx, a full communist society is beyond justice. Recall that for Hume, the idea of justice was a function of material scarcity, with enough wealth to satisfy the needs of every individual member of society, struggles over who gets what would vanish. Plentitude is one of the basic prerequisites of communism. Lenin's comrade and close confidant, the lawyer Alexander Goikbarg, explored the consequences of this claim in a 1924 article on justice and the ideology of law. As he saw things, the progress of justice, law, came to an end with the establishment of the bourgeois system. Goikbarg regarded the sprawling legal codes of modern society, indeed its entire machinery of administration, as outgrowths of capitalist relations of production. The bourgeoisie is compelled to conceal the unattractive nakedness of its system with eternal ideas, ideas of justice, law, etc. Guigbarg remarked, Oscar Wilde said that if a woman uses strong perfume, then she is something to conceal. Lefergue said the same is true of the bourgeoisie. <laughs>
Hence, the goal of a proletarian revolution is not to replace bourgeois law with proletarian law, but to dispense with the need for law altogether, namely by abolishing the value form. Chris Arthur, a British Marxist, has written eloquently on this subject in his 1986 treatise, Dialectics of Labour. For Marx, proletarian revolution is not a juridical rearrangement realizing justice, nor is it a narrowly economic matter of efficiently allocating resources in order to meet vital needs. It is a question rather of the fundamental transformation of social being, and so of individuals, their activity, and their essential relations. Quite simply, it has to do with what socialism is fundamentally about, the emergence of a human society. Some might well object that Marx's uneasiness with the juridical connotations of justice would hardly preclude adopting the versions advanced by figures like Derrida and Badiou. Derrida spe specified that the justice of which he spoke was never reducible to laws or rights, an incalculable justice rooted in the infinite asymmetry of encountering the other. That is, as outlined in his Spectres of Marx, a justice which is not for law, for the calculation of restitution, the economy of vengeance and punishment. He underscored the, necess the, fuck, he underscored the necessity of thinking justice on the basis of the gift, beyond right, calculation, and commerce. Badiou similarly stresses its higher, more philosophical balance. Justice is a philosophical word, at least leaving aside, as one should, its juridical signification, which is entirely the preserve of the police and the magistracy. Philosophically, he contends that justice is subjective and not objective as a condition of political truth. Why insist on the incompatibility of Marxism with these two more nuanced conceptions of justice? Or, for that matter, with the critical theory of justice articulated by Jürgen Habermas and Rainer Frost, or Rainer Forst. Forst's rendition, in particular, employs quasi-Marxist terminology when he speaks of different modes of normative justification, or the critical theory of transnational justice. Like his longtime mentor, the venerable Habermas, Forst attempts to traverse both liberal and communitarian theories of justice using a critical framework buttressed by certain normative commitments. Still, this approach suffers from the same limitations as that of the Frankfurt School more generally since Horkheimer's death. In renouncing the via neg negativa, it affirms only the most uninspired kind of social democracy. The so-called new international proposed by Derrida was little more than an incohate assembly, a link of affinity, suffering, and hope. Meanwhile, though, Badu's justice simply describes what is without describing, or what is without prescribing what ought to be. It remains a weightless, unhistorical option, i.e. the eternal inscription that our time is forever capable of. Every variation on the theme so far has had justice playing an ideological part, none of which is to say that Marxism is indifferent to injustice, or to any of the manifold hypocrisies that can be found under the capitalist social order. After all, Lenin was a legal advocate for workers in innumerable cases during the 1890s. He frequently highlighted this or that crying injustice, just as Engels had before him. Yet this is not the heart of the Marxian critique, nor can it be, short of a total revision of its principles. Workers will not be moved to action by endless exhortation, which unfortunately seems to be the strategy of most leftist organizations today. Scandal, infamy, outrage, the masses sooner or later simply tune out. Communists do not oppose egoism to selflessness or selflessness to egoism. Marx and Engels proclaimed in 1846. Nor do they express this contradiction theoretically in either its sentimental or its high-flown ideological form. They demonstrate instead its material source with which it disappears of itself, but do not preach morality at all. Unlike now, it would seem. By now, it should be clear that justice belongs to the ideological superstructure and not the material base. Despite occupying this rarefied space, however, ideology can have a repercussive effect upon the economic process, which is to say it can become a material force. <clears throat> 
Possessing no independent force of its own, the idea of justice can nevertheless conspire with other factors at pivotal moments to alter the course of history. Lenin reflected on one such instance in early October 1917 while preparing to seize power. Justice is an empty word. Say the intellectuals and those rascals who are inclined to proclaim themselves Marxists on the lofty grounds that they have contemplated the hind parts of economic materialism. Ideas become a real power when they grip the masses. And precisely at the present time, the Bolsheviks, representing revolutionary proletarian internationalism, have embodied through their policy an idea motivating millions. Of course, justice alone, the mere anger of the people against exploitation, would never have brought them onto the true path of socialism. Now that the material apparatus of big banks, syndicates, railways, and so on has grown, thanks to capitalism, now that the immense experience of the advanced countries has accumulated a stock of engineering marvels, the employment of which is being hindered by capitalism, now that class-conscious workers have built a party of some quarter million members to systematically lay hold of this apparatus and set it in motion, supported by the working and exploited people. Now that these conditions exist, no power on earth can prevent the Bolsheviks, if they do not allow themselves to be scared, and if they succeed in taking power, from retaining it until the triumph of the World Socialist Revolution everywhere. Significantly, Lenin started off by paraphrasing the young Marxist line, theory becomes a material force as soon as it has gripped the masses. Even after claiming that ideas can influence events, Lenin went on to list all of the material conditions which had to be in place to ensure victory, all of which further proves the point that Marxism is not founded on the notion that capitalism is unjust. Lenin's comments about the role of morality for revolutionaries made during a speech to the Komsomol in 1921 are no less perfunctory, effectively reducing communist ethics to the furtherance of working class interests. Trotsky would later note the way Lenin's flexible moral standards often led his enemies to accuse him of cynicism, claiming he subscribed to the facile belief that the ends justify the means. Values like justice and morality are strictly relative, shifting sands conditioned by material circumstances, not stable grounds for Marxist politics.